Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop, Getting Machine Learning Experiment Right, um, an introduction to cross-validation. My name is Renee Cho. Um, And uh, I'm a second year PhD student in computational biology. I am interested in applying computational and mathematical methods to biological data. I have been using uh, tree-based machine learning models, um, including random forest, gradient boosting machine, and XGBoost. Hey everyone, my name is Bilal. I'm a second year bioengineering student. Um, I'm, my main interests are in uh, transport and uh, metabolism in uh, the blood brain barrier. So I'm interested in looking at, I'm interested in using some systems level tools to look at uh, these metabolic networks and uh, transport fluxes that take place um, in the neurovascular uh, unit or the blood brain barrier. Uh, but yeah, that's. Hi, I'm Ria Samantha. I'm a fourth year graduate student from biophysics um, program. I'm interested in protein industry and membrane proteins, and I work with Dr. Mithi Siakla. And uh, my name is Jason Pan. I'm a third year computer science student working at the Center for Computational, uh, Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. I'm really interested in developing algorithms to transfer insights across different Context and data types, and I really like reproducible research. So, if you're interested in doing that and kind of working on tools and best practices for doing that, um, please reach out. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? So, <clears throat> all right, so we're just going to do some uh, quick polls just to get an idea of uh, what the audience would like. Um, so, just know you guys a little bit better uh, so the first the first one is basically uh, we're just going to ask what your primary area of interest is sort of like what your background is um, you know engineering computer science math or physics or are you someone from more of a life science uh, background so that poll should be up right now Okay, cool. So it looks like uh, um, it initially looked like it was a pretty even uh, split, but it looks like we have more people from like a cop sci or uh, math mathematical background. But uh, uh, but yeah, so hopefully this will be um, useful for everyone who's here. So the next thing we kind of wanted to know is um, do you build predictive models? Like do you use machine learning uh, tools or applications in your current uh, research or work? Okay, so it seems like a lot of you guys are, are familiar with this stuff, but um, we're trying to, we, we will try to make our, uh, do our best to make sure that even if you're not so familiar with this, that um, it is something that is easily digestible. Um, and so the next question that we had is, are you, uh, have you come across cross validation before? Okay, so seems like some of you guys have and uh, about 40%, it's almost half um, have not. So hopefully this will be very useful for you guys. And then the next one is, um, have you specifically, uh, can, you, can you explain uh, nest, nested cross-validation? Okay, so it seems like you guys are pretty unanimous in that. Um, so hopefully this will be a good workshop for you guys. <laughs> Think we go to the next slide. Okay, so 
So briefly, why, like, what is the purpose of this workshop? Why are we here? So really, um, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, uh, or like, you know, you guys kind of have an idea of this, but data science and machine learning nowadays, it's a very, these are very popular concepts and tools. There's a lot of packages that are out there and make it very accessible to use these tools in, in your work. But it's also really important to realize that uh, machine learning and data science, it's not just about taking these packages or, or tools and just throwing them on your work. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that um, you do need to think about uh, when you're using this type of work. So for example, for those of us who do wet lab research, right? When we perform our experiments, uh, we do a lot of other work to make sure that our experiments, our results are something that are um, generalizable, that can be replicated by others in the field. And so the, the thing that you need to realize is that this isn't something that's just unique to wet lab uh, research, right? This is something that is also uh, important for in silico or computational research. And we really need to convince our audience, the other people who read about our research or who might use some of our machine learning models that the results that we get with our models are something that can be generalized to uh, their work or, or their data as well. And it's not just simply an artifact of the specific way that we divide our data or the way that we structure our data, um, but it's you know very applicable to, their, to uh, the, the field. And really the key takeaway point is, is underlined here that the in silico experiments that we do also need their own set of careful uh, experimental protocols. So what will be the general um, timeline of this workshop? So we will have a 50 minute presentation, then we will take a short five minute break. Then we will do a 50 minutes hands-on tutorial with Google Colab and um, we will divide um, into eight groups uh, uh, for eight breakout rooms and where we will cover introductory examples um, and pitfalls. Then we'll cover a one large example and few extra credit examples. Then we'll take a five minute break, um, finally concluding remarks and question and answer session. So a general introduction to machine learning model. So what's the machine learning model? It's a mathematical representation of what the machine learning algorithm has learned from the input data you provide. And what does it comprise of? It consists of two things, model data and prediction algorithm. And why do we need a machine learning model? We need it to make predictions or decisions uh, without any explicit programming. So one example is polynomial regression. As you can see in this figure, you have this um, uh, X and Y you know, set of variables and this blue are the uh, sample data points and you want to fit a polynomial function. So the algorithm in that case would be to find a set of coefficients where you model a polynomial relations between these two sets of variables. And the output in that case would be a vector of coefficients uh, and um, the prediction algorithm would be the multi, uh, to multiply and sum the coefficients according to the polynomial function. So what is the general flow diagram of any machine learning modeling? You are given some data, you pre-process it, and you select some features which you think might be important to your model. And then you train the mathematical model and then you evaluate the machine learning model against the uh, test data and uh, you select uh, you essentially this three steps have to be done iteratively and carefully in order to get any um, good model okay so i apologize my uh computer's acting up a little bit but uh, so i can't really see the screen but um, so I'm just going to try to do my best, but, uh, th so the motivation, I think, yeah, so, uh, for this slide, we wanted to, um, or for this point we wanted to, we, so in this, in this talk, we're going to, uh, hone in on that last point there about evaluation or validation. So the motivation for validation, why do we care so much about this? So there's this great quote that, um, that I found, uh, which is basically if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. So what does that mean? Um, Basically, if you um, don't have 
if you're not if you're not incorporating the proper approaches, right? You can really do anything that you want with your data. You can um, uh, you can like structure like you can uh, manipulate it in a certain way um, so that uh, you can get like a specific result. And really, like this example kind of shows that where you have two sets of normally distributed data, they're uh, otherwise they're identical. But if you if you play with your data long enough or in, in a certain way, you can actually create something that is um, separable. And so really the points come down, uh, the points that we've listed here. So you wanna demonstrate that your model is robust to different data inputs. So for example, if you're trying to create a model that can say predict genetic mutations that increase your risk of cancer, right? You wanna make sure that that uh, is not, like that's something that doesn't just work for a specific set of patient samples, right? From one hospital, from one clinical, um, from one from one clinical site, but rather it's something that is generally applicable to all uh, to uh, everyone who who might need to deploy this model. And uh, you also want to make sure that you have a robust way of estimating your model's accuracy, and that you don't demonstrate patterns where there really are none, as was seen in the previous example. And then finally, you want to be able to select the model with uh, uh, that the, with the best performance. And that kind of comes down to point two, right? So if you can estimate your model accuracy uh, in a robust way, then you can also make these make uh, valid comparisons between different models. So um, when you're constructing a machine learning model, usually you will encounter mo models that have various parameters to tune. And in machine learning, a hyperparameter is a parameter whose value is used to control the learning process. We may have various models with different hyperparameter settings, and we will select the best model with the optimal hyperparameter combination. Uh, for example, for support vector machine, you may have to choose from uh, different kernels and different regularization parameters. And for deep learning, when you're building the deep learning uh, deep neural network, you may want to try different numbers of layers and also different learning rates. The plot here shows examples of um, different hyperparameter settings for a support vector machine. Um, here we have a classification problem, and our goal is to separate the samples with boundaries based on the input variable information. The four subplots are the results of training a support vector machine with different hyperparameter settings. And we can see that with different combinations of hyperparameter parameters, the decision boundaries of classifying the three classes are different. Um, so now you know that different models could result in different performances of classifying um, our samples. And usually we will perform a technique called grid search, uh, which is uh, um, to list all of the possible combinations of hyperparameters and build a number of models with these different combinations. So we'll um, we will have uh, various models. So with these uh, different choices, you may want to ask, how do we choose the optimal hyperparameters? And how do we select the best model? Um, so to select the best model, we have to understand the concept of underfitting and overfitting. And here we use linear regression as an example. Um, the orange line is the true fitting line for our data set. And when we build the linear model with degree of one, we say we have a low complexity model. When we built the linear model with degree of 15, in this example, we have a high model complexity. Um, when the model complexity is low, um, we can see the model, which is the blue line here, um, is not able to capture the relationship of our samples. And no matter how we move the straight line or rotate it with a different slope, it cannot capture the relationship. If the model cannot capture the relationship, um, of the samples, we would say it has high bias. And you can imagine that when applying this model on a new data set, it will have a bad performance as well. And when the model complexity is high, as shown in the right plot, we can see the model fits every sample points very well, which means it has low bias. And since it captures all, all of the relationship for every point, we say it has high variance. Uh, it may seem to be a good model. However, you can also imagine that when you apply this model to a new data set, uh, when it will not predict the outcome correctly. You can see that 
um, the blue line is different from the true feeding line, uh, which means that when we have a new sample with X value, and we want to predict its Y value, not underfeeding or overfeeding. And also with this evaluation method, how do we select the best model? Okay, um, so we can evaluate the model performance by calculating the prediction errors for our samples. And there are many methods for calculating the prediction error. For example, you can use root mean square error for uh, regression problems or a class error for classification problems. And in general, the lower the prediction error, the better the model performance. And here we calculate the prediction error for the training samples. And the plot here shows that when we train the low complexity model, um, the prediction error is high. This is because the model is not able to capture the true relationship in our samples. So we have high prediction error. And when, the, uh, when we train a high complexity model, we have a low prediction error indicating a good performance. But um, is this where we want to be? Uh, remember, we are evaluating the model with the samples that we use to train the model. And you can just recall that the plot of overfitting, uh, where the, there are, um, um, this means that our model does not generalize. So here it, it is important that we have a test set um, that contains the model should never see the samples in the test set. With the prediction errors for the test samples, we see that when the model complexity is low, uh, same as the training set errors, the error rate is high. However, the test error goes down a little bit when the model complexity increases, and then it starts to go up when the model complexity gets higher and higher. Um, when we train our data set with different types of models like SVM or neural network, or with the same type of model with different hyperparameter settings, we predict on the test set to evaluate the model performance. And the dotted line here is the best model uh, where the test set test error is the lowest, and uh, which means that the model is not underfit or underfitting or overfitting. Um, so this is um, where our uh, model uh, overfit, and this is where our model generalizes. So again, we use test error to evaluate the generalization of the model. And here's a brief conclusion about uh, what we have learned for how to evaluate a model and to choose the best model. Um, now we know that different models have different levels of model complexities. Low complexity models have high bias and low variance, and they underfit the training samples. High complexity models have low bias and high variance, and they overfit the training samples. So we set aside a group of test sets, which we will never use them to train our model, and we use the test samples to evaluate the model performance. Um, so we can see that the test error, which is the yellow line on the plot, um, it is a combination of the error caused by bias and the error caused by variance. And we choose the best model with the lowest test error, um, as indicated by the dotted line here. And next, we're going to talk about how to estimate the test error with cross-validation. Cross so, uh, so as uh, Renee just said, there are these uh, elements that you have to think about, like splitting your test, uh, splitting your data into a test set and a validation set. And then also there's this idea of quantifying the, the error uh, from your model. Now, there are a couple ways to do this, a very simple way to break up your data set is to just, you know, break it up, um, uh, like, 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 as it's shown in this example, just break it up into um, a validation set and a training set, like, so split it in half, basically. Um, and so what you do is basically you would train your model on uh, the, the training set, which is highlighted here or colored here in blue. And all the numbers here, they basically represent dif different observations from the data set. So for example, seven is the seventh observation, 20, 22 is the 22nd observation, and so on. So in the first case that we have uh, on the top, 
7.22nd, uh, 7, 13th, and 44th observations are all in the training set. And the 56 and 91th observations are in uh, the, the validation set, which is, in, which is represented by the color, uh, by the peach colored uh, bar. So the first question that comes up is how exactly, or what is the best way to split your data set? Because I could have done it this way uh, in the first, first example where uh, 7, 22, 13, and 44, those, those observations are in the training set. But then I could, I could have also done it so that um, 44, uh, so that uh, 44, 56, and 91 are the ones in the training set. So like, how do I choose which data sets, which observations to put in the training set and the validation set? Um, so that is one issue. And the other issue, you can, you can hit next and the, the, the plot should show up. The, yeah, there we go. So the other issue that comes up is every time you split your data set in a, in a certain way, like that, that can affect the errors that you're calculating. So in this, this, uh, this graph here, basically what it's representing is, um, is showing the mean squared error uh, that was calculated from uh, when a polynomial function is being assessed. And so they're looking at like the best way, like the, uh, the ideal complexity of this function. And so like, as Renee said, like there's different trade-offs um, that, that occur with complexity, with model complexity. And so uh, each color represents a different split uh, of the data set. So for example, like in the yellow set, uh, when, they, when they ran the different, um, when they analyzed the error, it seems like the best, the best fit or like the lowest, sorry, the, uh, the lowest error comes when, there's, when the model is, when the polynomial function is about seven degrees. But then like right above it in a different split, uh, the best or the lowest error seems to occur when it's only uh, a two, two degree polynomial function. So as you can see there, the different way of like the different splits of training and validation set can affect the actual error that you're calculating. And so this means like the error, the way of calculating error isn't as robust as you ideally want it to be. And the other, uh, the other problem here is that as you're splitting your data into both a validation set and your training set, you're not able to use all of, all of your data to train your model. And generally what happens is that the fewer data you can incorporate into training your model, the, uh, the, the, it reduces the performance of the model. And so cross-validation is something that can address both of those points. And so really um, what, the way this works is that now we can split the data into different, um, into different parts and then resample it. So this is a simple cross-validation approach, the K-fold uh, cross-validation approach where the data set is, is divided into uh, K, K parts, which in this case would be uh, five different parts. So K equals five. And uh, as you can see, now we have uh, like basically five different chunks. And and in the first row, in the first case, like that first part, the first fifth of the of the data set, that is set aside as a validation set, and the model is trained on on the rest, everything after that, which is in blue. So that's like the first. Uh, um, so that's done first, and the second time you, you run through it, uh, the second fifth is the one that's held out, used as the validation set. The model is trained on everything else, and then used, um, and then um, it's tested against the validation set. So this is done five times uh, in this case. And what, um, what's really nice is that uh, every time we re repeat the cross-validation approach, the error values that, that we get are pretty similar, which is shown on the graph on the right. And so in this case, you can see that despite multiple uh, iterations, every time the error values are pretty close. It's a much more robust method than the simpler approach that I discussed on the previous slide. Uh, so for more detail about how to implement cross-validation, um, first, we split, split the data into k folds, and for the first iteration, we set the first the first fold as um, the test set, combine the remaining folds as training set. For the second iteration, we set the um, second fold as test set and combine the remaining fold as training set, and so on. So here, we use the training set to train a model and use the test set to evaluate the model, and the same for another iterations. And with this procedure, we, um, we collect the number of test errors and use the mean to estimate the error rate. So you can imagine that the test error um, has an underlying distribution. And with cross-validation, we are actually collecting the samples from this distribution and estimate the distribution mean. And we get a better estimate of the test error um, than simply split the data 
um, to just one training set and one test set. And also we can calculate the standard error of the mean. The plot here shows two models and um, based on the estimated test error, how would you select the model? If you choose the model with the lowest test error, then um, will this be the real test error for your selected model? And in other words, is um, the error unbiased? So as mentioned before, uh, we may have various models with different hyperparameters, and we will have to select the best model with the optimal hyperparameter combination. And when you want to use the test error to set, select the best model to, and to evaluate the model performance at the same time, um, things would get trickier. So let's look at a simple uh, example, which uses only one training set and one test set for model evaluation. Um, and here we train the model with the training set and evaluate the model performance with the test set. Um, so if we have a second model, we use the training set to train a second model and use the test set to evaluate the second model. We choose the best model that has the lowest te er um, test error, which is model B here. Um, however, is this the true test errors of the chosen model? Are we underestimating the test error because the error may happen to be low by chance during the selection? So a better way to evaluate the model when you are going, uh, when you're doing model selection is to split the data set into training, validation, and test set. So here we train model A and B with a training set and validate model A and B with the validation set. And in model, uh, if model B uh, has lower prediction error, we select model B as our final model. Um, and again, the prediction error from the validation set could be biased because we choose the model based on the lowest error. So we set aside a test set beforehand and after selecting model B, we train the model again on the aggregate of training and validation set and evaluate the model with the holdout test set. Um, so to, to reiterate, um, we use validation set to select the best model and evaluate the chosen model with the unseen test set. Um, and to combine model selection with cross-validation, first we split the data into a training set and a test set. The test set here uh, will never be used during the training of the model uh, machine learning model. And next, we split the training set into k folds. And for each iteration, we use the training set to train the model and use the validation set to calculate the prediction error. For the second model, we perform the same procedure again. And we select the best model with the lowest mean of cross validation errors, which is B here. And um, this is the process of model selection. We then train the chosen model with the entire training set at the beginning and evaluate the chosen model with the unseen test set. Um, so for this entire procedure, we selected the best model, which is good. And we also evaluate the model performance with the holdout unseen test set. Um, but can we do better? Can we apply cross-validation to a test set to get a better estimate of the test error? And perhaps with a standard error of the estimate. So here is how we can do to get a better estimate of the test error with nested cross-validation. And overall, we use inner loop to select the best model and use the outer loop to evaluate the model performance. So here's the inner loop. In the inner loop, we perform a k-fault cross-validation to choose the best model. And then um, in the outer loop, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then in the outer loop, we train the chosen model again with a uh, large training set and evaluate the model performance with the test set. So we will have hands-on practice for building the nested cross-validation. And uh, so don't worry if it seems complicated at the first time.
And next, we're, uh, we will talk about cross-validation pitfalls. Great, so we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about the different ways you have to split up your data into uh, a training set, validation test set, and test set multiple times. But what are we really getting at here? The problem is that uh, in any procedure, um, you have to consider, you ha your, your goal is to estimate how well a model does on data that you've never seen before. And it's difficult to estimate um, that the distribution of error on data that you've never seen. Um, so there are a couple common pitfalls. First, in machine learning models, um, a lot of times uh, folks will pick out the feature selection. For example, you have some gene data and you want to pick out which genes are predictive of something. You must remember that that feature selection is part of your training process and must be done uh, on data that you, uh, on training set only, and you cannot do that on data that you will evaluate on. We'll see a very clear example of this in the, in the tutorial that we shall share later. The second thing, um, let me emphasize again that our goal here, the reason why we do the different k-folds, um, is to estimate, is to have um, some estimate of the distribution of data, data that we expect uh, to see once the model is trained, like what the, what the data distribution or what the data looks like out in the real world. Um, so it'd be really weary in your own research if you get uh, deeper into evaluating machine models of uh, performing balanced sampling. So for example, you might be wanting to predict predictors of rare disease. So um, the data you have for people without the disease, the control, it's going to be much more abundant than data um, for uh, whatever phenomena you're predicting. Um, I shall leave that there. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, and uh, for those of you who uh, are perhaps, uh, well, I guess we did a poll earlier that showed that everyone, uh, nested cross validation was new for everyone. But I want to make everyone aware of some other uh, strategies that you can also take. Uh, and those are leave one out cross validation in which you do as many folds as possible. So you train on all, you train on all samples, but one, and you evaluate on one sample. Um, you do that repeatedly. And the second one is instead of splitting our data into um, non-overlapping folds, you can simply hold out a certain random proportion of data repeatedly. So these are other uh, two options for uh, cross-validation and other two strategy, strategies that you can nest with one other. Um, but we'll upload these slides so you can refer to these later, but right now we'll go back to uh, nested cross-validation. Great. So um, that's the presentation part of our talk, mostly done. Um, and I want to get everyone excited for the tutorial, and I'll give you a brief overview of the tutorial, of the tutorial that we've designed. Um, we'll start with a motivating example of why seeing test time or validation date time data is so, so dangerous, uh, mainly because you want to convince whatever your reader, your people who are pop, uh, reading your paper, or the people who are going to deploy your model, that your model indeed does generalize to unseen data. Um, with that kind of motivating, motivating example in hand, uh, we'll walk you a step-by-step -step walkthrough for setting up a nested cross-validation protocol in Python. Um, and then uh, with nested cross-validation as a tool, uh, we'll see how powerful it is by setting up uh, data, science, data science experiments in one function call, um, and you can take that home with you. And finally, for those interested, uh, there are some fun take-home exercises you can do, um, uh, but you know, let me know if you get to that next. So um, uh, in our workshop, we'll be working with this thing called the support vector machine um, that uh, Renee kindly explained earlier uh, several slides ago. A support vector machine is a classifier that separates um, classes of data. So on the left, you have the blue points and the brown points. And, it's simple, and a support vector machine simply selects uh, a maximum margin se separating hyperplane, meaning a line, a linear line that is furthest away from both points uh, in the two sets um, that best separates the two sets. Now, the hyperparameter that we'll be trying to select or the model that we'll, we'll try to select will depend on these things called kernels. And they simply uh, tell you how wiggly or what shape or how nonlinear the separating line can be. Um, so uh, you can think about this as an analogy to the polynomial model where if we say that the line is linear, it might underfit. Um, uh, and if you select the line to be this complicated line, for example, the, the polynomial model or RBF model, then you might be more prone to overfitting. 
um, or you might capture the real, real, real things about the data. But we will have to be able to kind of figure that out on validation data and then evaluate that at test time. Um, great. So here's where we are. Um, uh, we'll have a five minute break now, uh, and then we will send you into your breakout rooms uh, via Zoom and have 15 minutes to work through the, through the, through the tutorial. Uh, we'll come back after the tutorial and have, have a five minute break again. Sorry, we'll have a, after the, the tutorial, we'll, get, we'll send everyone on a, on a five minute break, um, and then we'll come back for concluding remarks and some question and answering. Um, so uh, before I send everyone off, uh, I'm going to leave the um, collaborating notebook link here. So please take this time to open the link now. Um, oh, yep, I can. Uh, Renee, can you please post the link in chat? Oh, no, you're, you're, you're presenting. Um, Rhea, can you please post the link in chat? Uh, and we'll take a five minute break now. So we'll come back at 1.45. And in the meantime, um, you can either take a break or we'll be here to answer some questions. Great. And so you won't have to write any code, but you will have to pay attention to some lines you will need to uncomment. Um, and if you have any questions, please try to discuss with the folks in the room. Um, and if that doesn't get resolved, please come back to the main room, which you, where you can then uh, ask us questions. Uh, and um, you can then return to your other rooms that you've been assigned. Alrighty. Um, so, uh, Daniel, please take us away and break everyone out. Renee, I think you're muted. Yep. Um, so, for today's workshop, we learned um, nested cross validation. Um, and for inner loop, uh, this is for selecting your models. And for the outer loop, this is to evaluate your model um, within unbiased test error. Great. So um, hopefully everyone's got a gentle introduction to several tools, actually. Uh, we saw uh, scikit-learn uh, being a really useful thing uh, to just run models on data really quickly and, and also learn how to use these things. Um, hopefully I've shown you how um, you can write these things into functions and that function calls in Python are easy. Uh, so we'll, we'll do things in Python. Um, but for those of you interested, so let me first shout out uh, Google Collaboratory that some folks, you know, people have some interest in. I think everyone was here, here for that conversation. You all have access to that. And on Google Collaboratory, you have access to all the Python packages that you want to, to kind of do nice things. So some resources here that I want to point you to is scikit-learn, which is what we used to uh, train the models and split the data. There's scipy, which is um, uh, more statistical or prob statistical packages. So for, so for things that are less uh, under the machine learning umbrella and more for the um, scientific computing umbrella. And then um, there are things to get, get you organized. So this is pandas, which is the kind of uh, analogous package to the tidy. Um, uh, and Dippler in an uh, R. And then to make plots uh, like we did today, uh, we use matplotlib, but if you want, a want to make things you know, less uh, low level and more abstract, you use C1 on Altair. Um, I won't dwell on this too much. We'll send the slides out and everyone can have, can have access to this. Um, yeah. So for today's workshop, uh, getting machine learning experiments right. Um, we know that data science is hard, especially in, in interdisciplinary research. And the ultimate goal is to convince the audience that um, the patterns and knowledge, as well as your models are A, um, are generalizable, and B, are reproducible. So now we have one more important tool uh, added to the toolkit, which is net, nested cross validation. And we hope you enjoyed today's workshop and learned something new. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. And before that starts, I think I wanted to point out a, th a question that a lot of people had. And I only had the chance to answer in two rooms, and that is, uh, in our example, we saw that uh, everyone, um, uh, our model luckily picked the RBF kernel for every single inner loop. So, you know, if you want to deploy your model, then you just pick an RBF. But someone asked the question, what if the model parameters are different for every single loop, which is certainly what you expect in the real world? Um, and I think this question uh, harks back to 
the goals of the workshop, right? And that is one is what is your end product you're looking to sell with your with your work with your experiment. If that is an experimental protocol and a science experiment, then I think you will be comfortable with having your models being different, uh, being parameterized differently, and all you're trying to sell is that my experimental protocol and my contribution to science, right? is a protocol that will generalize to this degree, which is a measurement of accuracy on test sets that had no signal, right? Uh, on models that had no signal in test sets that you evaluated on. However, if your goal is to deploy the model, put it online and say, hey, um, I trained one final model uh, so that, um, so that uh, you know, maybe some new researcher can come and use my model and predict something on their own data, um, then you do have to make some design choices um, there is some feedback from your test set. Um, but what you can communicate using this nested cross-validation procedure is that this is your best faith effort at picking a, a model with the correct all the hyperparameters. Um, and this is what we got in our experiment. And this is the result we got, we got, in, we got in our experiments. Um, and the whole point is to, is to convince people that this is a best faith, best faith effort and you have some reasonable estimate of the error that you see uh, in new data. So if someone has your new data point, what is the probability you're going to get this, get this correct? Um, and by doing this train test split multiple times, you, you are able to do that. Okay. So, question time. I had a question. So, uh, how does this procedure change during the, I guess this would be in the inner validation stage, um, when we have, say, continuous hyperparameters for our models? So, instead of having just a, a set of parameters or a set of different types of, you know, functions that we can apply, what if we have, say, like yes. tunable parameters? Right. Um, great, great question. Um, so, uh, the way you do it is you simply sample the the easy way to do it, and the way that most people do it, is you simply sample a set of parameters from this continuous, from the continuous parameters space, um, and you pick the you pick you pick the best set, um, or you pick the best one um, to do so. Um, uh, if you do it via, say, a grid search, which is you you sample these continuous variables at 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 you, at, at intervals, and you can do the same thing where you can treat them as, as basically different ordinals and you can average over these different things. But, um, but yeah, the, the sample, that becomes more, more complicated. But luckily, in the notebook, at the very, very bottom, there's a link to this paper uh, about random search for hyperparameter optimization. So if you go read that, you might get some insights. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 